the man is lifting in grace, right? Uh, okay. Allow me to paraphrase it. Instead of saying lifting in grace, say grace that lifts. So I don't care, well, not sounding to be collapsed, but whatever situation that you may be in or condition you may be in, the grace of God is sufficient to lift you from Amen. that sufficient, from that situation. Amen. Amen. So the question is, are you going to tap into that grace? Take for example, Peter, when he stepped out of the boat and started walking on water, and then as he was going towards Christ, life happened, right? As it happened to all of us, he started to drown. So the question is, what's causing you to drown? And as you are in the process of drowning, who do you cry out to? Because when you look at Matthew, uh, I think it's the first scripture, Peter cried out to Jesus and said, Lord, send me. So the question this morning is, who do you cry out to when you find yourself drowning in the challenges of life? The second instance would be Matthew 8. The leper guy. He comes to Jesus Christ and says, God or Lord, if you are willing, hear me. So I, I just want to say, family, this morning, not only is he willing, it is done by the grace of God. That he is with you. He has already healed us from whatever condition. Because remember, leprosy was a skin condition. It could be any number of skin conditions, but they would just identify it as leprosy. But once you had that condition, liber, you would be excommunicated from the, from the community. You would have to stay outside. So basically, they would send you to your immediate death. So now, let's move forward to 2024. Yes, medical technology, they found the cure for them, but we still have leprosy of the mind. Where your thinking is affected to a point by, yeah, some people might excommunicate you, but as we continue. So, before we start running, uh, let's look at some few definitions. I like to believe that we know grace, right? Yeah. It's unmerited favor. It's undeserved favor. It's a gift that you've been given without you deserving it. Yeah. Take, for example, the thief on the cross. Remember when Christ was going to be crucified, that guy, he was in the middle, one on the left, one on the right, kept on mocking Jesus Christ. And the other one said, remember me when you enter paradise. Just like that, he got his salvation. That's grace. It's a free gift. He didn't have to do much. He just said, remember me. Take Barabbas. Remember Barabbas? When uh, Pilate asked, who should I free? Jesus or Barabbas? So now, when you study the history of Barabbas, he was guilty for, he had proper reason. He had been found guilty to be in prison. So he was destined for crucifixion. Whereas Christ, on the other hand, they planted him. But the people shouted, free Barabbas. Look at grace. And remember, Barabbas is a shadow of you and me. Barabbas represents the church. That if Christ did not die for us, we would all be destined for hell. So you see why I say, from time to time, we just have to say, Baba Siyabon. Baba Siyabon, for the grace. I, I may not have the tangible things that, yet yeah, we want. Mesler's hierarchy of needs. You know when you start going up there with the hierarchy of needs? I may not have those things. But remembering the free gift that I have been given, that he was sacrificed for me, and the sins that I know I have committed. So that's uh, grace. So we'll hold on to that. So the next part would be lifting. You said the theme for the month is lifting in grace. So lifting has to do with ascending, right? Moving from one level to the next. So if you're operating at 20% top of grace, the entire time you move to a next level. So now, 
Why do we need to understand it? If it's not for grace, we would confuse activity with progress. Because we do find people who are busy, but they're not progressing. It becomes what's that thing? a figure of eight. You're going around the mountain, wilderness, your own wilderness. You're going around the wilderness, but you're not going anywhere. But because of grace, it removes that form so that you can see what this thing that I'm being with, it's not taking me anywhere. I think I need to change the strategy or change my approach. But if I do not tap into the grace of God, I may be busy for the next 40 years of my life with no progress. Man. So I think the children of Israel needed the grace so that they can still know my uh, most GPS is a bit faulty. The perfect example is the prodigal son. Oh, yeah. Where well, now we, we, we think that we don't need, uh, we become so conceited, full of ourselves, that the activity that I'm doing, it's by my own strength. So now the perfect example would be the prodigal son. Remember when he started thinking he, he knows everything, he left the father's house to go uh, do his own thing. And guess what? John 10, 10 happened. While he was in the wilderness, somewhere out there, uh, they will, with the devil, he will come. As John 10, 10 says. So as he comes, where the, in what condition does he find you? Where you have removed yourself from the covenant of the Father, you have detached yourself from uh, fellowship with other believers. You're operating on yeah, the leftovers of the grace that you have. Because when he comes, he does tell us what has he come to do. And now, the thing is, here's what I've discovered with this guy. <laughs> He's smart. He does not attack everybody the same way. He's going to take and make your attack. The prodigal son, uh, I don't know, but it suggests that he had a tendency of entertaining prostitutes. That's what scripture suggests. So the devil tempted him with what he liked. So the question is, we need to do our own introspection. What is it you like that he may, when he comes, and tempt you that your patience, your proclivities, because now, that's how he, he, let's make an example of, I'd like to think, this is me thinking, I don't have uh, problems with Banyan, or what? I'd like to think, that I'm not, I'm this kind of thing. So he would not come and tempt me with that. Amen. He would see what do I have challenged, he'll study me to see, okay, that man loves mine. That man has got proclivities towards this, and then he will start tailor making his temptation so that uh, he turned that to not my thinking. You know? Amen. 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 So, as we know, the thief came, and the rest was history. He almost found himself eating with the peas. So, when we look at Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, it reads as follows For it is by Grace, you have been saved. So now we, we just gave the definition of grace, right? So instead of saying, for it is by grace, I want to say, for it is by undeserved favor, I have been saved through faith. <laughs> so I, I understand that I did not really need to be saved. There's like 8 billion people on the planet. Uh, Who's that guy? India just passed child. So there's like 8 billion people on the planet. From that 8 billion people, as I was looking at uh, doing the research, only 2.4 billion people are Christians. So there's like 5 billion people who are not Christians. But then again, look at 2.4 billion. There's other denominations, and then we know what it, within Christianity, there are people who are not really Christians, right? We know that. So there's 2.4 billion Christians, and I don't know two people billion, you are one of those people. What makes you think you're in jail? Oh, randomly. 
you, you found yourself handpicked. Look at grace. But there's other people, that five billion, that has not yet received Christ, which now, I think we've got that great commission. We need to go and tell the people about Christ. Because, here's what we, we, we know. We all know how the story ends. In the absence of Christ, hell is waiting. There's no sugar coating. In the absence of receiving Christ, hell is waiting. In the that is whether Buddha, Muslim, all those are, in the absence of Christ, it says this, there's only one way to the Father. It's through me. So, as we continue, what is salvation? The definition that I tend to work with is God's personal or divine plan to redeem, reconnect, and reposition men to himself. So it's a three-part uh, message uh, whenever I get the time. To say the redeeming part, Christ had to pay the high price with his blood. Remember, Old Testament, they used to offer blood of bulls and goats, sheep, and all those things. And then the blood, that blood was not enough to satisfy the debt that Adam didn't get. So Christ came to redeem us and purchase us, to redeem us with Bible. So he had to pay with a high price, his blood. Right. So once we understand that, then you start taking your salvation. We treat it very yeah, tender gloves because we were bought at a very high price. And then the second part would be reconnecting. So now, you shall eat, whenever you eat the fruit, you shall surely die. That's what God told Adam and Eve, right? So after they ate the fruit, they were cut off. Their umbilical cord, the connection to heaven, was cut off. That was the death. Where being separated from God, it's a spiritual death. This is why Christ on the cross cries, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabakata, which translates, Father, Father, why have you left me? So now, Christ understood that the moment Christ, God, steps away from you, or turns his back from you, you are dead. That's spiritual death. Right? Amen. So that would be the, re the reconnecting part. And then we've got the repositioning part that uh, I'll center my discussion to on just for a few minutes today. Uh, the repositioning part that we all need to undergo as believers. We need to understand that uh, authority is associated with the head, right? Authority is associated with the head. And in, in Genesis 1, 26, he said, I'm giving you authority or dominion over everything on earth, right? So now, with that said, he gave us authority. So when we fell from grace, when we fell, the head was the head fell. So now if something falls from here, there's my head, it by gravity goes down. Right? Hold on to that analogy. So now the head also has to do with the image. I guess that's where you see me. So now those who are in the image of God are the ones who are supposed to rule. So now since we fell, we fell from our image, we fell from our uh, authority. <laughs> Let us turn to uh, Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verse 8. <coughs> Finally, brothers, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is love, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think of such things. So now, our thinking should be on high things, heavenly thoughts. It should be up here. But because our head, our authority, we fell from up here, we fell to the ground. So now we became carnal in our thinking. So now when you go to Romans, uh, no, I think I want, let's start with Colossians. Let's start with Colossians. I wonder if I gave it to you. Colossians 3, where it shows the, what a carnal mind constantly 
things about them. Because remember, when we were in the garden, when we were in authority, we are supposed to be thinking heavenly thoughts. We are supposed to be thinking like God. But because we fell and fell to the ground, we became carnal. So, this is the mind of a carnal person. So, uh, to kill, deprive, or power, and the evil desire making in, in your members, those animal impulses and all that is earthly in you, that is employed in sin, sexual vices, impurity, sensual appetites, unholy desires, and greed, and perversionness, and idolatry. These are the natural thoughts of a carnal man. So, if it was not for grace that located you and me where we were and put us on the narrow path, where we start changing our thinking, this is how we are supposed to be thinking. Amen. This is how reprobate we are supposed to be thinking. But because of God's grace, after Romans 8, verse 5, let's see what, what it says. Uh, those who live according to the sinful nature, you can say, eh, can, can I eat? Eh, sinful nature, have their mind set on what the nature desires. Mm -hmm. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on this, what the spirit desires. Do you think by your own strength you would be able to set your mind on the desires of the spirit? No. Me, just, just thinking, it's just me thinking. It's, it's, it's impossible. That's why we need to lift in grace. We need to increase our grace power. So that we do not find ourselves thinking like that. So now, when we go to Exodus 13, verse 18. Okay. You have it there. So God let the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. So, remember, we just said that we fell, the mind fell, right? Authority, just hold on to it. The authority fell to Canaanite on the ground, right? So now, the Israelites, they come out of Egypt and they go up. So the journey of most believers, we start in Egypt, sin, Egypt, sin. Where now it's down there, but now we need to go up. That's the progression of every believer. So now, how do you litmus test? Check yourself on where are you in the salvation journey? If you are still in Egypt, sin, you are still in Egypt, you are still operating at Canada level, you will see with your thoughts, your speech, how you conduct yourself, that no man, I am not yet repentant. The mind of Christ is not yet in me. There's still work that needs to be done in me. All those Christian growth classes, Bible school, I still need to go attend so that the old man can be killed. Because we start in sin, you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you progress out of sin, and then now we start moving from the legs, and then we come somewhere here, the torso. And now you are moving from Egypt to wilderness as we progress. But to virtually think that you can do that by your own strength, we've seen some try. Mm. So, ultimately, ultimately, we are supposed to, after the Lord has done his work in us, we progress from uh, the second level, wilderness, and then we go into, we go back to the head, which is the third part, which is the infirmity. Take, for example, uh, as I was looking at that, uh, the life of the caterpillar uh, yeah, came up on my screen. But a caterpillar is not destined to remain as a caterpillar. It's destined to be a butterfly. But where does it start? Come on. It starts on the ground, being a worm, crawling, eating whatever it can eat on the ground, up until it gets located and put it on the narrow road, which is ah. You were eating and going anywhere. You were doing whatever you wanted to on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Up until you step through those doors, you accepted Christ. Now you are here listening to us. Now you are here thinking, about, there has to be more in life. I can't just be living for, you know? Man. 
Amen. 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 So, what the caterpillar does, after it's been put on the narrow path, right, which is us, now we're here, all the caterpillar does is eat. They are going to eat leaves, eat leaves, their dietary I think it's leaves. They are going to eat, 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 eat. That's all they do. They don't question where the food is coming from. They just eat. Which should be our attitude. We eat the word of God. We eat it, eat it, eat it. To a point whereby we start eating knowing there's what's that process called metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. It, it finds itself falling into a cartoon. It does not know on which day it's going to find itself in a cartoon. So it goes with us. It's like you just come to church, you start attending prayer, you start attending services, you start attending, you start attending, you read the word, you pray, you start doing all these things. You don't know when you're going to find yourself in a cartoon where God is going to isolate you. And after he isolates you, he starts saying, This is what I've told you. Because he's the one who made you, he knows why he made you. Therefore, it is in him you will find your purpose. You can read all these books, self motivation books, but if it's not attached to God, you might be doing what is right. You might be doing what is good by every standard. But whether it's right in the kingdom for you, is this what you were called for? Because remember, each and every person out of this, a billion, you've got a unique fingerprint. That God knows I put you here on earth. Take for example, angels. We've got archangels. You had your Lucifer, uh, Gabriel, and your Michael. They've got their own specific function. Lucifer was the morning star. He would usher in worship and all of them, right? Uh, Michael is the man of war. He shows up, the attack. Gabriel is the messenger attack. He's the one who appeared to me. He's the one who appeared to. Uh, Elizabeth, you know, he's more of the messenger, but there's others. They've got their own personality, and they've got seraphims that are sitting at the feet of the Father, constantly saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. So, if angels, when he designed them, each and every one has got a specific function, what more about us? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 I'd like to think we also have a particular function that God desires from us. But it's only when we are in Christ that we will discover our true purpose while we are here on earth. So that's what happens to the caterpillar. It goes into the uh, yes metamorphosis. It goes into that cocoon and it comes out as a butterfly. And once it's a butterfly, it no longer crawls, it flies. So once you have been transformed by the renewing of the mind, by the renewing of the mind, the things that you used to enjoy, you will no longer enjoy going to chill with those prostitutes, the prostitutes guy, the prostitutes guy. Maybe he did, but once you get transformed, you will no longer enjoy doing the things that are at a canon level. But now you'll be seeking things that are on a higher plane now. You'll be asking asking questions at that level. Okay, Lord, (coughs) what more can I do for the kingdom? So, all of this work will be done through faith and grace and a total dependency on God. Let us turn to John 15. says, I am the vine, you are the branches. So in, in this journey of ours, we need to know what we are. Eh? You are branches. <laughs> we need to know what we are. Unless you are like uh, Aaron's rod. I don't know if you remember the numbers. Aaron's rod, rod they, they were disputing and they had to make a decision. So they took all the rods of the people in the community, and they put them in a room and then they closed. When they came back tomorrow, the one that was budding, uh, they were going to slay that person as a leader. So that rod was not attached to anything, but it started developing, it started budding. Unless you are that type of rod, I highly, highly doubt it. We are branches that require to be attached to the vine. Amen. And the vine is Christ. So the moment we detach ourselves, we're not going to bear fruit. Amen. Amen. 
And we know what happened to the fig tree. The moment it did not bear fruit, when it was in season, mm. he cast it and said, never again will you bear fruit. I used to think it's because maybe Jesus Christ was hungry. Because when you look at that scripture, it says Jesus was hungry and he went to the fig tree. And because it had leaves, it was in season. He expected to find fruit. Because we are in the right church, we are being fed the right word, we are in season. But when Christ comes and checks and says, ah, where are the fruits? Crickets. In a world that values self-sufficiency and independence, depending on God may seem outdated. Yet as Christians, we are called to rely on Him for everything. Total dependency on Him. Once I know that if I step away from the vine, who pay me now? Then my the politics that I'm faced up with whenever I come to church or whatever, the politics they, they, they are gonna become so small because I understand if I allow these minor politics that I'm faced up with, that I'm faced up with, they are going to affect me the long run. So, uh, long story cut short. Mama uh, Long story cut short. 2017, I'm from East Coast Christian Family Church. So, my pastor passed on, uh, Ruben Mohammed. He went to be with the Lord. Uh, being a young man, guess what I did? The product has some tendencies. I left this Lord. And then we found ourselves, yeah, living the life. <laughs> uh, you, you, would, you, you do not see the, you know, the, the, the death of the fruits. You do not see it immediately. But in a long, long run, because I think you, 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 we, we leave. We still have that residue, that grace on us. We still are able to come and preach. We are still able to do this. We are still able to do all this. But you are no longer detached. You are no longer attached. You are detached. So now, a few years later, you find yourself, how? Oh, everything used to move at 120, but now everything seems to be stagnant. Mm. So it would take grace for, with the grace of God, to open up yeah, this young man's mind. He said, hey, you, you catch yourself, you're a branch. You moved away from the vine. Yeah. Hence, you are stuck where you are. You should be this far by now, but because you detached yourself. As we continue, in Matthew 6, uh, from 25 to 34, <laughs> Jesus speaks to his followers about the importance of trusting in God, God's provision. He reminds us not to worry about what, he, what we will eat, drink, or wear. Instead, we should seek first his kingdom, and all these things will be added to us. So, maybe we are asked, but how, God? How will these things be added? Number one, <coughs> total dependence on me. Instead of doubting me, because a double minded man is one who does not totally depend on God. If you've got one foot in, like, uh, I trust God, but I need to do everything for myself. But a total dependent spirit to say, you know what, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trusting you to show me. Like I said earlier, it is when you are in, in God, it's when you're in Christ that you will discover, right? Deuteronomy says, He has given you ability to acquire wealth. So the word ability, He has given you power. The word power, He has given you skill. And that skill, if you work on it, diligently so, you will be able to attract all these things. Take for example, Tyler Woods. He has given you ability, skill. So now, I, I, I don't know, but I read somewhere that he started playing that golf thing at the age of five. So the theory is, uh, man hours, for you to master playing the keyboard, master any, any skill, whatever ability that God has given you, if you want to master it, you need to spend 10,000 hours doing it. That's what yeah, half a school of thought says. Mm -hmm. Whatever you are doing, if you have not spent 10,000 hours on it, you are not yet dominating. Because remember, 
Genesis 1, you have been given uh, authority to dominate. So the skill you've been given, you are supposed to dominate. And after dominating that skill, all these things will be added onto you. That's how we attract all these things. We're like, oh, so how do I discover my, my, my skill, my talent? I'm 45, I'm 25. In Christ. Amen. 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 Because once I'm in him, he knows. He knows what he created me for, so he will, he will reveal it to me. And then I start dominating, spend time working on it, dominate that skill, and then he will restore the time the King Kawans ate. He will restore the time that I had wasted not being in him. Amen. 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 Take that guy who did KFC. Oh, he was. Well, let's give him a look. Hey. Uh, I believe the prayer of every believer should be Lord, I need you in this matter, in every matter. Amen. Everything that we do, that is my prayer moving forward. But even the things that I used to take for granted, now I'm like, Lord, you know what? I, I'm trusting you for your leadership in this. Why? Let's go to Numbers 9. Numbers 9, we started verse 17. Is it up? Okay. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Whenever the cloud settled, the Israelites kept. So, this is now, they're in the wilderness. They've left Egypt, now they're in the wilderness. So, as they're in the wilderness, we know that by day they will be led by a cloud. Let's, let's go to 18. Okay, we'll stay at 18. But the Israelites moved when the cloud moved, when the cloud stopped they would stop. So the question this morning is, whatever projects that we are busy with, it may be marriage, raising kids, uh, attending school, who's leading you in those things? Is it me and my intelligence? Or I'm depending on the leadership of the club? Because we know the club represents the Holy Spirit. Amen. That when the club moved, we move. When it stopped, we stop. Oh, still have a family. Who's going with? And then we wonder why we end up in shipwrecks. The next part it says, at the Lord's command, the Israelites set out. And at his command, they encamped. At whose command? Are you setting up? Are you camping? That relationship, not as they say about it. That relationship that you are in. Whose command is it? Because it says, at the command of God, the Israelite would move or stop. Uh, let's go to 18. At the Lord's 19. As long as the cloud stayed, sorry, sorry, let's finish in 18. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in the camp. Yeah, there's a version that says, when the cloud tarried, it stayed longer. It did not move. They, they did not become agitated. I've been here for far too long. I've been doing this thing for far too long. They would wait for the command of God. So that's the question that I'd like to pose to us this morning. The project that we are busy with, the journey that we are on, have we waited long enough, have we tarried long enough to say now I'm sure I heard the voice of God. As we continue, uh, what does 19 say? I think we ended 18, we were 23. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. I think it's more or less the same thing that I just said. So, when, whenever we, 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 we do not uh, submit ourselves to the grace, submit ourselves to the action of the leadership of the Holy Spirit, it is an indication of not 
really understanding what grace is all about. Because grace is total dependency on God. To say, I'm not going to attempt trying to do this by my own strength, but I'm going to depend on the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So, depending on God requires surrendering our desires for self-control. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6 urges us to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. I think this is the, 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 the downfall or one of the harms for a lot of uh, believers. Once I've got a degree, I've got this, I've got that. I know what I'm doing. I've got this. And we stop depending on God. Because now you think you understand the systems of men. And then after you think you understand the systems of men, you substitute God for your own intelligence. But like the seraphims that are constantly saying at the saying at the feet of Christ, of God, holy, holy, holy. That should be our story as well. On a daily basis, we renew our dependence on God. Second Corinthians 12, verse 9 to 10. The Apostle Paul speaks of finding strength in his weakness. He learned that God, God's grace is sufficient and his power is made perfect in weaknesses. Let me put it this way. The moment I know I'm weak in something, I no longer want to hide it and be a bravado man. It's like, hey, I, I don't want to show my weaknesses. Paul says, I know that Christ's strength is made perfect in that weakness. So it's no longer me who's going to deal with that weakness, but Christ himself. So he's going to make my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So the weaknesses I may have, I take them to Christ because I'm totally depending on him. But you know my flaws, fix me Lord, so that I can totally depend on him. Re depending on God means recognizing our limitations and relying on his strength to carry us through challenges. James 1.5 tells us, if you lack wisdom, we should ask God who gives generously, depending on, uh, sorry, gen who gives generously. Depending on God involves seeking his guidance and wisdom in our decisions, making it, making it, turn, to, making it turn to prayer that will lead to lead us from falling off the mark. So, as we looked, when we started, we looked at Ephesians 2, uh, verse 8 and 9. Here we know that we are saved through grace and faith. So now, as I was looking at uh, that passage, I was like, for today's discussion, I want us to define faith as trusting God, right? So that's the definition we're going to use. I know Hebrews 11, 1 says faith is the evidence of things that we go for. But let us substitute the word faith for trusting God. So now, when we look at Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, Hebrews 11, 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we're going to remove the word faith, and then we put trust in God. So it would read, and without trust in God, it's impossible to please Him. So if I don't totally trust Him, or fully depend on Him, I can please Him. So what kind of a believer am I? Uh, look. Uh, let's look at Hebrews 11, but let's go to verse 8. <coughs> By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would 
later receive as his inheritance. So instead of putting faith there, by trusting God, Abraham left, left yeah, he went to a place he would later receive as his inheritance. Obeyed and went through. Uh, he did not know where he was going, even though he, he did not know where he was going. Next verse. <clears throat> By trusting God, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger. In a foreign country, he lived in, a t in tents and did, and did Isaac Jacob, who were heirs with him uh, of the same promise. I want the Sarah one. Let's go to the next one. In verse 11. <coughs> By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, uh, age, and Sarah herself was buried. So now, we remove the word of faith. We say, By trusting God, even Abraham, even though he was past the age, and Sarah was herself buried, but because they trusted God, it was counted to them. So I think that's the, the point I'm trying to drive home here. Or faith does not need to be a mystical thing. That like what is faith? Like, oh, I'm trusting God, but what is faith? Trusting God. But I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm trusting God in everything that I do. That I invite Him in everything that I do, that God hears what I'm doing. So, when you look at Habakkuk 2, Habakkuk 2, verse 4. He says, uh, I want the King James Version. I want the part where it says, But the righteous will live by faith. I want to say, But the just shall live by faith. So now, we said we're removing the word faith, right? We're saying, But the just, or the righteous, we live by trusting God. Amen. 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 So if we want to live, we need to live by trusting God. Amen. Now, a small and a background story on the guy who wrote this. this. You remember Habakkuk? He writes the, the, the book as a letter to the Israelites just before they were captured by Babylon. So as he writes this, these people are going to be captured by Babylon. They are going to be slaves. And I'm sure we know those, the three boys that we normally talk about. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. So he writes this to them. Those that trust in God, what, uh, the, the just, which is you guys, the, the, the Daniel, Shadrach, Abednego, shall live by trusting God, even in captivity. Even when they were taken to Babylon, we shall live by faith. And how do we do that? Lord? By trusting God. So when they get to captivity, we go to Daniel, let's turn to Daniel chapter. Did I give it to you? Daniel chapter 3, let's start there. Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, let's start at 1. Oh, sorry, 1 3, sorry, the other way. 1 3. 1 3. Okay. okay. I think I wrote the wrong thing here. Let me just find it in my book. So now they are in captivity, and they've just been told, you are going to live by trusting God, not as, right? And then we go to verse 17. So this is the part where now, I would say, to those four young men, God gave knowledge, understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. So who gave them the knowledge? God. God. So if I have one knowledge, I need to come to God. He's the one who's going to give me the knowledge. Amen? Amen. So now, remember that it's just been told that you will live by faith. 
by trusting God. So them trusting God, God gives them knowledge. He gives them understanding. He gives them ability to solve those men's problems by trusting God. Hopefully I'm making sense here. Yeah? Like, it does not matter that the subject, how difficult it may be, but trusting God like what Daniel did, God will open your mental faculty so that you understand those subjects. Amen. 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 So, as you continue with the story, Samuel Daniel, verse 18, I think that's where I will, I will wrap up due to time. Verse 18, remember, now uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Genesis, sorry, chapter 3, chapter 3, they have been chosen by the king, the three boys, Daniel, Shadrach, and Abednego. They have been chosen by Nebuchadnezzar. And they've been put as, yeah, they were doing something nice, doing things for him. Uh, they were prominent people in the, in, in, at Babylon. Because of trusting God, they found themselves being put at prominent positions. Anyway, now, Nebuchadnezzar decides to erect a statue of himself. And he puts out an edict to say, whoever does not bow down and worship whenever the champion rings, those people will be thrown into the fire. I like to think we know that story, right? But verse 18 is the one that really touched me. After they, they were found guilty, they are about to be thrown into the fire. After all of that, after all of that, they are about to be thrown into the fire. This is what these boys say. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O oh King, that we will not serve you, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of God you have set up. That type of faith, where you say, even if it does not come through for me, I will not serve any foreign God. I will not compromise the, my standards, the standards that God has set for me as a believer. I think that's what I'll, yeah, I'll close with to say, as we live by trusting God, we just shall live by faith, by trusting God, we get to a point whereby even if even if that which I'm hoping him for does not happen, it does not change who God is in my life. Because I've trusted him all along. Even if. So we need to get to a point whereby now we believe God even if. Because he sacrificed his only begotten son for us. So these are the things that are being added. They are being added. The most prized position is having Christ as our Lord and Savior and dying for us. Amen. So, family, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity that uh, I was granted to come and speak with you this morning. Uh, Prophet, uh, do I hand over to you or 